Thank you very much, Dr. Marie. So again, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second uh, episode of the psychogeriatric sessions. For you, who, for those who have joined us uh, last month, we started off the, we kicked off the lecture series with a lecture by Dr. Sharon Antonio Buenaceda on comprehensive geriatric assessment. So this afternoon, we are going to focus primarily on the changing landscape of uh, Alzheimer's dementia. And again, uh, we try to schedule these sessions every first Monday of the month from starting at one o'clock in the afternoon. And our target audience are essentially uh, senior residents and early career psychiatrists. But of course, everyone uh, is willing, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, welcome to join these sessions because uh, and, and participate in the discussions because we think that it will be of benefit to everyone concerned. Okay, so with that, again, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's uh, meeting and I'll turn it over back to Dr. De Leon. Okay, so it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our esteemed speaker for today, Dr. Robert E. Buenaventura himself. He is a graduate of Bachelor of Science, major in clinical psychology, magna cum laude in Far Eastern University, Manila. He graduated Doctor of Medicine and did his residency training in general psychiatry here at the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center. Then finally did his postgraduate training in psychiatry of old age in New South Wales Institute of Psychiatry in Sydney, Australia. He is a diplomat of the Philippine Board of Psychiatry and Life Fellow, Philippine Psychiatric Association. He is the current Associate Professor, Human Lifespan and Psychiatry at La Consolacion University, Philippines in Malolos, Bulacan. He is also a consultant psychiatrist and visiting lecturer here at UERM. He is a visiting lecturer, School of Tropical Medicine and Global Health, Nagasaki University, Japan for the summer session of 2022 to 2003. 2023, I'm sorry. And he is a faculty member in Beatrice Emerging Market Summit in Bangkok, Thailand last November of last year. He is the current chairman of the specialty board of Philippine Psychiatry for 2023 to 2024. And of course, the current president of the Philippine Psychiatric Association. So without further ado, let us all welcome our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Robert D. Buenaventura. Thank you very much, Maurice. Okay, I'll just start by sharing my screen. So for everyone- Recording support, in progress. Okay. So we're recording the lecture because I'll be sharing this to non-medical groups. Um, they uh, hopefully will be able to appreciate these lectures as well. So mabuhay at magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Today's topic is the changing landscape of Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, the title of this lecture will be self-explanatory later on as we go through the lecture. Hopefully that will give you a better understanding of uh, why I chose this topic. Okay. Essentially, the title of this lecture came about because for, uh, for everyone's information, I do a series of seminar workshops for senior residents in various training institutions across the country. So the last time I did this, I did that was with a group of residents from Western Visayas Medical Center, West Visayas State University, the, cons the, the training consortium, and for the residents of the Eastern Visayas Medical Center in Tacloban. Okay. So I'm planning to do a say on, on my next series of uh, seminar workshops on psychogeriatrics will be will start in August after the media convention and continue on after the diplomatorial examinations. Okay. According to the World Health Organization, there are more than 55 million people living with dementia worldwide, more than 60% of whom are in low and middle income countries like the Philippines. Every year, there are nearly 10 million new cases of dementia. It is currently the seventh leading cause of death and one of the major causes of disability and dependency among older people globally. In 2019, dementia cost economies globally 
more than 1.3 trillion US dollars. Approximately 50% of these costs are attributable to care provided by informal carers, including family members and close friends who provide an average of five hours of care and supervision per day. So it's not just in terms of direct costs such as hospitalization and medications, but also in terms of direct costs in terms of, for example, uh, productivities lost due to individuals having to take care of patients with dementia. Unfortunately, women are disproportionately affected by dementia, both directly and indirectly. Women experience higher disability adjusted life years and mortality due to dementia, but also provide 70% of care hours for people living with dementia. And that cuts across cultures and countries. So not just in well-developed countries, such as, the, such as in North America or, or Western Europe, but we also see that a lot in Southeast Asian countries, including the Philippines. Okay. So my objectives for this lecture are the following. So I will go through them one by one. Just to provide a brief history of Alzheimer's dementia. And interestingly, the woman who you see here in the leftmost picture, her name is Auguste Deter. Okay, so her initials are the same as Alzheimer's disease. She was a German woman who lived in the early 20th century. She was reported by her physician, Dr. Alois Alzheimer, who can see in the middle, to exhibit a cluster of unusual symptoms considered evidence of mental illness, including memory loss, language difficulties, and unpredictable behavior. Alzheimer examined Detter's brain after her death and found it to have unusual tangles of fibers and abnormal clumps. A few years later, in 1910, Dr. Emil Kraepelin, a psychiatrist and colleague of Alzheimer's, published a medical book in which he described Augustiter's symptoms and the results of her autopsy. Kraepelin coined the phrase Alzheimer's disease to name her disorder. For psychologists and psychiatrists, we are very familiar, of course, with uh, Emil Kraepelin because he is one of the forerunners of psychiatric and psychological nomenclature. Fortunately, at this time, we do not have to wait for the patient to die to see what is going on in his or her brain. Um, this, for example, is a PET scan that shows amyloid deposits, highest amounts are reflected by the colors yellow and red, okay, in the, that build up in the brains of patients with either early onset or late onset Alzheimer's disease. Okay. I want to share with you the current national demographics for the elderly so that you will have a better appreciation of how extensive the problem can be. So the information that I'm going to share with you comes from the Philippine 2020 Census of Population and Housing that was done in May 2020 at the height of the pandemic. Would you believe that at the height of the pandemic, people were going house to house to do a census? And I remember this because I participated in this census. So as of May 1st, 2020, the Philippines has a total population of 109,035,343 persons. The Philippine population increased by 8,053,906 from 100,000, 100,981,437 in 2015, which translates to an annual population growth rate of 1.63%. By comparison, the rate at which the country's population grew from the period 2010 to 2015 was higher at 1.72%. So we can see a consistent decline in our population growth rate, which was first noticed in the 1960s. So in the Philippines, people aged 60 years and over are regarded as senior citizens. They made up 8 0.5% or 9.22 million of the household population in 2020, higher than the 7.5% or 7.53 million recorded in 2015. So in five years time, the proportion of elderly increased by 1%. There were more females than males, 55.5% females and 44 point versus 44.5% males among the senior citizens. Although if we look in terms of the overall population, the male to female ratio is almost the same. 
uh, the same trend was observed in 2015. So, uh, and was also observed in 2010 in the previous censuses as well. So the, at, after the age of 60, there is a slight uh, numerical advantage to the female sex. So as you can see, there is a continuing increase in tr increasing trend in the proportion of the elderly in the overall population. Okay. So from 7.5% in 2015 to 8.5% in 2020. So we are seeing that the Philippine population is actually growing older. And I mentioned earlier that this can have um, uh, an implication as far as the number of patients that we're going to see. So I keep reminding uh, psychiatry residents right now to expect that at least, you know, one out of 10 of their patients will be an elderly individual. And that's why I take it uh, upon myself to be able to teach them about psychogeriatrics so that they have a better preparation as far as dealing with uh, these patients I concerned. So for the purposes of everyone who's not, um, uh, well, does not have yet a solid psychiatric or psychological background, let me define what dementia is. Okay. It is a global and chronic condition characterized by a loss of cognitive and intellectual abilities, severe enough to impair social or occupational functioning. However, I'd like to emphasize that the global deterioration occurs only at the mid to late course of the disease. So you don't see global deterioration at the outset, okay, or in the mild or early stages of the disease. Although we still use the term dementia widely, uh, it, uh, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the sort of quote unquote Bible of the psychiatrist, we refer to it currently as major neurocognitive disorders. Okay. So what are the core manifestations? Uh, it basically starts with memory impairment. So individuals with incipient or underlying Alzheimer's disease uh, who are going into the mild stage of the illness will start off first with being very forgetful. Okay, um, it, it's it's usual to forget stuff like where you put your keys or where you put your eyeglasses, but it's going to be somewhat uh, different when you start forgetting the names of your loved ones, especially your spouse, whom you've been married to for 30, 40, 50 years, or you forget where you live, okay? Or you don't recognize your children anymore, okay? So that's going to be a different story. Then this will proceed to intellectual deterioration. That means the frontal lobe functions such as calculation, um, judgment, okay, will be impaired as well. And this can mark the entry of the patient into the moderate stage illness. And then eventually during the severe or late stages of the illness, there could be what we refer to as personality disorganization. So the individual who has severe Alzheimer's dementia will practically be unrecognizable by individuals who know him or her. Okay. Other manifestations which we particularly see during the latter part or the latter stage of the illness would include behavioral or psychological symptoms, including violence, irritability, or psychosis. But it's not uncommon to see this also during the moderate stages of the illness. When we talk about dementia, it consists of a broad category of various conditions. The most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer, Alzheimer's dementia, as we have mentioned early on. It can account from between 60 to 80 percent of all dementias. The next one, the next most common would be vascular dementia or what we previously referred to as multi-infarct dementia. And then a combination of Alzheimer's dementia and vascular dementia. So those, uh, those two conditions would be the most common types of dementias that we would see. There would be other forms of dementias that we would see in clinical practice, including Lewy body disease, in which the individual has deposits of uh, protein called alpha synuclein in the brain, affecting uh, that, that affects uh, neurotransmitter systems that in, that in turn can lead to problems with thinking, movement, behavior, and mood. And then peaks disease or frontotemporal dementia. This is the most common cause of dementia in patients under 60 years of age. And this type of dementia is characterized by a spectrum of neuropsychiatric symptoms ranging from those that affect the patient's personality to those that cause a decline in cognitive function. 
Um, recently, you may have heard uh, that uh, Bruce Willis, who was initially diagnosed with... Uh, okay, we'll just wait. Okay. So, you may have read in the news a while back about Bruce Willis, who was diagnosed initially with aphasia, and then recently... Uh, there was some more uh, specific diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. Okay, then other dementias can arise from Kixi's coexistence with Parkinson's disease, and then of course one, um, I would say popular in a quote unquote, but uh, this uh, sort of uh, very well known in literature, what we call traumatic brain injury, dementia secondary to TBI, and we see this a lot among boxers and football players like for example like a few years back uh we there was a film starring will smith the famous infamous will smith entitled concussion he was a, a neurologist who was investigating uh, dementia type of illness among uh, retired football players okay so tbi result tbi dementia results from chronic and repeated uh, injury to the brain okay so, and that's why we see it more commonly among boxers and football players. In fact, for, for boxers, the that, that term that was used before was dementia pugilistica, okay? Uh, so, because that was seen specifically among these groups of individuals. So, as we can see, the various causes of dementia would include neurodegenerative conditions, vascular disorders, alcohol and substance use disorder can also cause this. Two more subdural hematomas, no more pressure hydrocephalus. And what we also commonly see in clinical practice, although this one, it, it's a, a little bit more easy to identify. Uh, so including cardiometabolic conditions, okay? Uh, uh, including vitamin B12 deficiency, which we see a lot uh, in among uh, Caucasians, okay? So hypothyroidism, hypoglycemia can also uh, mimic a clinical picture of dementia. So um, other metabolic conditions can include uh, like hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, when I was a medical student, this was something that we saw a lot, uh, patients developing a clinical picture of dementia secondary to derangements in liver function. Okay, so what are the risk factors to develop dementia? The most critical risk factor would be age, okay? Let me show that with the graph. So this is from uh, a study that was done by the Alzheimer's Cohorts Consortium published in Neurology uh, in 2020. So you, as you can see, this consists of uh, seven different studies um, from uh, various countries in Europe, in, plus the United States, okay? And what you would see is that the older individ the individual gets, uh, the older the cohort, the higher the proportion uh, or the, the incidence rates of dementia, okay? So age alone can, can sort of determine uh, whether the individual would be at risk to develop dementia. So the older the age, the higher the risk, okay? So other risk factors would include a genetic or family history of dementia, Illnesses including diabetes and heart disease, which I've highlighted in this graph, in this tape, uh, in this slide, Down syndrome, multiple sclerosis and sleep apnea, depression. Uh, in, in, it, it can, depression can be a risk factor and depression in the elderly can have a manifestation we call dementia syndrome of depression in which the, uh, the elderly patient persists primarily with cognitive dysfunctions, okay. Uh, lifestyle factors such as smoking, healthy alcohol use, poor diet, and lack of exercise can contribute. Brain injury, as we have mentioned, strokes, as we have mentioned, and of course, uh, infections of the brain. So these are just some of the risk factors. There would be a lot more. So when we talk about the prevalence of dementia, the, the WHO reports that dementia cases have tripled worldwide. So in, and, and this, looks in terms of particularly in the last 30 to 50 years. So, so there is an increasing trend as far as dementia prevalence is concerned, especially in Asia. And again, um, we, we look at it from uh, two different perspectives. The part of Asia that is rich, such as South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan, 
and the part of Asia that is somewhat poor, like South Asia and then Southeast Asia, including countries like the Philippines. Okay, um, so the incidence sort of parallels, but there's a little bit of difference. Uh, but we don't we won't belabor that point at this point. Okay. So in South Korea, the number of demented people is expected to double in 10 years. On the other hand, the number of demented people will reach 7 million by 2025 in Japan. Okay. And arguably, the demented population will become a severe worldwide problem in the near future. Actually, not just in the near future, but uh, we're already seeing at present uh, high prevalence. And as we have mentioned earlier, a high impact as far as the economy is concerned. Okay. In the Philippines, in a study that was done by Dr. Jackie Dominguez et al. in 2021, the crude incidence rate was 16 cases per 1,000 person year. So let's just focus on that. 16 cases per 1,000 person years. Uh, somewhat uh, parallel study that was done in Spain in 2019 showed an incidence of 8.6 uh, cases per 1,000 person years. So as you can see, the the incidence in the Philippines, the crude incidence rate was about twice that of what was seen in Spain. Okay. So this is what I was referring to earlier about differences in incidences compared to, shall we say, high income countries versus low and middle income countries. Okay. And we will be highlighting that a little bit more later on. So let's look in terms of the process of aging because we mentioned earlier that age is the most critical factor as far as the uh, uh, the most critical risk factor as far as the development of dementia is concerned. I took uh, selected countries in terms of life expectancy. This data is from the World Bank, and as you can see, life expectancy is generally increasing worldwide, especially in Asian countries such as Japan and South Korea. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you could consider longer lifespan a serious problem, okay? But uh, we can see here in the red color, the Philippines has a life expectancy of 73 at the in the year 2020. So if, if you were born in the year 2020, you will expect, you can expect to live up to the age of 73. At the last one in blue, you can see the world average. So the world average in 2020 is 72. So the Philippines, um, is uh, somewhat a little better as far as the worldwide average is concerned. But if you look at the other developed countries in the region, including Australia, Hong Kong, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand, Singapore, and as a point of uh, uh, as a as a point of comparison, I included United States. You can see that they have much much more longer life expectancies. But if you look at the low and middle income countries, such as Indonesia, India, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, okay, uh, the life expectancies are expectedly lower. Okay. So, so that means the, and we have shown earlier that the longer you live, the higher the risk to develop dementia. So that if you have a longer life expectancy, if your country, I'm sorry, not just you, but if your country has a longer life expectancy, then you would expect that your country would have a higher risk or probably even a higher prevalence of dementia. Okay. But unfortunately, we still, in terms of absolute numbers, you know, in terms of the number, actual number of people who have dementia, they would still be seen largely in low and middle income countries. Okay. Now, again, why is aging a risk factor? And, and we look at it in terms of biological age-related changes that the individual undergoes. And these are normal, normal physiological or biological changes that happen to us as we grow older. You know? For example, that includes gross structural changes, loss of neurons that can be seen as uh, cerebral atrophy, which can affect mood, behavior, and cognition. Decreased adaptive capacity, neurotransmitter receptor changes, increased vulnerability to side effect of medications and others. Okay, so aging itself, okay, has uh, um, there's a, there. What I'm saying is that there are complex reasons behind why aging is a critical factor as far as uh, the risk for developing dementia is concerned. So it's not just technically about growing old. It's what happens to us as we grow old. And uh, 
and and that's why it's very critical to look into other uh, factors. Okay. Our psychiatric disorders and cognitive impairments are one of the problems interfering with active aging. So I'm just uh, including this because it mentions uh, uh, cognitive neurocognitive disorders. So over 20% of adults uh, older than 60 years suffer from mental or neurological disorders. So we're, we're looking in terms of one out of five, okay? Um, so that means uh, mental and uh, mental health conditions, which would include neurocognitive disorders, will be seen very commonly in the elderly. And as I've mentioned already, the increase of life expectancy raises attention to uh, aspects related to longevity, primary, secondary health, social care, and policy planning for the elderly. This group represents around 23% of the total global burden of the disease. Imagine globally, 20% um, of one out of five um, in global burden of the disease in terms of uh, costs, okay, will come from the elderly. And the major burden, and this third sub bullet, this third bullet point I'd like to emphasize, that the major burden of aging process associated with cardiovascular, respiratory, and muscular, musculoskeletal diseases, cancer, mental, and neurological disorders. Okay. Elderly patients with Alzheimer's dementia presented more severe comorbidities and higher risks for dyslipidemia. So this help kits can help explain not just why aging is a risk factor, but again, the concomitants of aging, okay? So that uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease who have medical comorbidities and particularly severe uh, medical comorbidities would be, uh, would, would be at higher risk to develop uh, other comorbidities and can lead to uh, more severe uh, manifestations of the illness. So what are the, and that, that, that segues to the topic on what are the common comorbidities in the elderly. So these are the 10 common chronic conditions for adults 65 and over. Uh, uh, this is from the National Coalition of Aging. Um, as you can see Alzheimer's disease is one of them and so is depression, okay. But uh, let's, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly, would, I would particularly like to emphasize cardiometabolic conditions such as hypertension and diabetes because these two conditions will appear very frequently among the disorders, I mean, among the literature, okay. So common comorbidities would include hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, thyroid disease, okay. In the Philippines, we don't have similar data, but I was able to find uh, the top leading cause of death among older persons age 60 years. Okay, so as you can see, number one with cardiovascular disease in all forms, and number six is diabetes mellitus. So these are, again, very uh, significant conditions to be uh, wary of. Okay, so older patients with mental disorders, especially severe mental diseases, suffer from more physical and cognitive impairment okay, and social function disability, which further damages their physical health. So the the uh, comorbidity of uh, aging and mental and, and physical disorders can uh, lead to the occurrence of mental disorders, including cognitive disorders. So the mental health conditions can be related to an unhealthy lifestyle and diet, side effects of psychotropic drugs, metabolic disorders, fixed physical activity limitations, and lack of physical exercise. Okay. So there are other, there are various factors that uh, we need to consider. I'm I'm mentioning this because again this will have implications later on in terms of why there is a change as far as the landscape of Alzheimer's dementia is concerned. Okay, physical comorbidities could also affect the severity of mental illness symptoms, increase the emergency admission rate, prolong hospital stay, increase the number of rehospital rehospitalizations. So you can see the effect in terms of, uh, shall we say that there's a two-way effect, okay, as far as uh, mental health conditions and the uh, comorbid physical conditions are concerned. So, so let us now mention in term, talk about in terms of what changes in prevalence that we are seeing and, and reflect and what, how it could reflect on the changing landscape. So what is it that we usually see? So this is, this slide shows the typical, okay, typical uh, process that happens as far as dementia is concerned. So uh, this is a paper from, uh, a report from Dementia India 
And they estimated that 5.3 million Indians aged 60 years, 60 years and over had dementia in 2020. And this number is projected to exceed 14 million by 2050. So in India, in the span of 30 years, there will be a, at least a triple, okay, a three times uh, increase in the uh, prevalence of dementia in the country. And, and this is what is usually seen, not just in India, but in other countries as well, particularly low and middle income countries. Okay. So this is from the paper on changing demography and the challenge of dementia in India. Okay. But, but this is what we're starting to see in some countries, okay, or in some regions. We are seeing a declining incidence. So recent estimates suggest that the age specific incidence of dementia is declining in high income countries, okay? So this information comes from a paper uh, from, published in the New England Journal of Medicine based on the Framingham Heart Study. As you know, participants in the Framingham Heart Study have been under surveillance for incident dementia since 1975. The original start study started in 1948 and then in 1975 they started to monitor the participants for dementia but it wasn't until 1981 that they started administering the mini mental state exam or the MMSE every two years to be able to have an uh, objective assessment of, uh, of the incidence of dementia. So they're looking at different cohorts okay um, so you can see that uh, the five-year age and sex adjusted cumulative hazard rates for dementia were 3.6 per 100 persons during the first epoch, late 1970s and early 80s, uh, going down to 2.8 per 100 persons uh, during the late 1980s and late early 1990s and 2.2 and then 2.0. So this, uh, so the relative, relative to the incidence rate during the first epoch, the incidence rates declined by 22%, 38%, and 44% respectively during the subsequent epoch. So essentially, um, for different groups or cohorts of individuals, the incidence becomes less and less. Okay. This is based on a paper uh, that was published in Neurology in 2020, uh, looking at the 27-year time trends in dementia incidence in Europe and in the United States. So the incidence rate of dementia in Europe and North America has declined by 13% per decade over the past 25 years, consistently across seven studies, okay, uh, which included uh, the studies represented various countries, including the United States, France, Netherlands, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and Iceland. Okay. The incidence is similar for men and women, although declines were somewhat more profound in men. The reasons for the decreased incidence are not clear. Again, I'd like to emphasize that the reasons for the decreased, decreased incidence are not clear, although several medical interventions that influence blood pressure, cholesterol, and inflammation may have contributed. Again, there's a lot of uh, subjunctive sense. No, It's not clear and then may have. Okay, So these are mainly suppositions or assumptions at this point. Okay, um, so what we're going to see here would be projected incidence of dementia in millions based on the seven studies. Okay, the red uh, line graphs are globally, the solid line would be current, and then the broken lines would be projections. Okay, um, so there are two sets of lines here. The red ones would reflect global, and then the blue lines reflect the based on the results of the uh, Alzheimer's cohort consortium study. So that will be reflective of the European countries and the USA. So as you can see at this point, uh, the, the incidence is already much lesser in Europe and USA compared to global rates. And then if the projections hold true, like you can see that globally it's going to decrease and then, um, but it, it, it's still increasing, but the increase will not be as sharp. But for the but for Europe and the U.S., you can see that there is sort of a plateauing. Okay, um, it's it's probably still increasing, but not as much 
as it is currently doing now. So the, eventually the incidents would plateau. So that is what their projections are based on the data that they have at the moment. Okay. This is a paper that was commissioned by the RAND study group. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know why that happened. Okay. So the age adjusted prevalence of dementia decreased from 12.2% in 2000 to 8.5% in 2016. So a period of six years. This is based on the health and retirement study that they have. So they have an ongoing, just like the Framingham study, they have ongoing data collection. And, and so uh, they decided to extract some of the data. Um, in they have about 21,000 individuals. They have data from more than 21,000 individuals. And these were individuals who underwent clinical assessment for dementia. Not just, you know, I think you have dementia, but really these individuals have a clinical uh, assessment for dementia and underwent uh, sub, uh, objective testing. So you can see that uh, there was a, a remarkable decrease from 12.2% to 8.5% in a span of uh, six years, a statistical significant decline of 3.7 percentage points or 30.1%. Among men, the prevalence of dementia decreased by 3.2 percentage points. Among women, it was higher at 3.9 percentage points. Um, one of the things they observed based on their subjects, but they mentioned that they observed a substantial increase in the level of education between 2000 and 2016 in their sample. Okay, so that means the samples in 2016 were better, much better educated than the sample in 2000. So what are the possible explanations or assumptions for this? Again, I'd like to emphasize the word possible and also the word assumptions. Okay, uh, the, the, this uh, explanations are primarily from the paper of Dr. David Nockman published uh, in JAMA entitled The Enigma of Decreasing Dementia Incidence. So the first comment was that it is worth considering which advances in healthcare delivery or sociocultural trends could be associated with a decreasing rate of incident dementia. Because he mentioned that it's not probably something related to dementia, like the process of how the individual develops dementia, for example, having plaques and tangles, uh, so, so things like that. Okay, so it's probably not that because that hasn't changed. He said. So he, he said what could have what could be what could have changed would be in terms of healthcare delivery and social cultural trends. So that means things stuff that are external to the individual, okay, not internal. Okay, uh, and of course we cannot. The only way to prevent aging is to not age at all, and that means we you can die prematurely. So the major role of Alzheimer's disease in cognitive impairment is generally appreciated, but there is also a greater recognition that non-Alzheimer's conditions often coexist and moderate the clinical expression of Alzheimer's pathology. So the expression of uh, Alzheimer's disease is not just due to the disorder, but, but there could also be other factors. And that's the reason why I highlighted comorbidities, medical comorbidities, uh, because uh, these are, which would be included in non alzheimer conditions. Okay? And, and as mentioned here, can moderate the clinical expression of Alzheimer pathology. In the eighth decade of life and beyond, multiple etiologies are the norm for per persons with later life cognitive impairments. So it's not just one possible, for, so if an individual in his or eight is developed uh, dementia, it's what, what Dr. Nopman is saying, it's not just possibly due to one condition, but could be several. So this multiple etiologies would be related to what is referred to as multiple morbidity, although it's not yet in this slide, the next one probably. Since the mid 20th century, reductions in mortality and morbidity associated with cardiovascular and cere cerebrovascular disease have been well documented. Stroke rates decreased substantially in the last decades of the 20th century. Improvements in cardiovascular health have roughly paralleled decreases in dementia incidence, excuse me, in Western Europe and the US as we have also seen. Okay. Improvements in survival in late adulthood within the past 50 years 
can be plausibly accounted for by improvements in the general medical care of not part, no particular single disease and any disease condition for that matter. And also by a slight reduction in multimorbidity. That means a reduction in the number of comorbid medical condition. So instead of having osteoarthritis, um, diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, what else? Uh, if you lessen that, if you lessen these multimorbidities, then it can also lessen the uh, risk factors that are involved in, in producing Alzheimer's. So multimorbidity is associated with later life cognitive impairment and its reduction would be associated with a reduction in dementia incidence as well. Social, cultural, and educational life experiences may have an association with the clinical expression of later life cognitive impairment that is independent from neurobiological determinants such as Alzheimer's disease or cerebrovascular disease. Educational level is an excellent proxy for some of the sociocultural determinants of the dementia risk as was seen in that study by the RAND Corporation. The quantity and quality of educational opportunities in Europe and the US have undoubtedly improved in the last, in the past 100 years and could possibly, possibly be hypothesized to have an association with a reduction in the appearance of overt dementia. And then finally, uh, he added, he, he finally said, childhood health and well-being as sociocultural modifiers of the clinical expression of later life cognitive impairment is also considered but have no adequate evidence at the moment. So what does this mean? Basically, like if we lead a very a healthy childhood and let's say teenage years, okay, eat well, get exercise, you know, study well, you know, uh, a, a lack of physical illnesses, okay, then you know, essentially that will proceed to uh, young adulthood, the middle age, and even late adulthood. So good early patterns of behaviors, especially good healthy patterns of behavior. Can, can persist if, 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 for example, these are natural habits of ours, like if we eat right, if we exercise well, okay. So if we continue to have those uh, well-being strategies, then, you know, it's something that we can just uh, continue to have as we grow older. So in, in summary, I'd like to mention that dementia may not be as scary as we once thought, if, because before we thought that once you, um, you develop dementia, that it's, you know, uh, going to be downhill from there on and that people will deteriorate quickly and become a huge burden to their families. Although that, that is still a possibility, but it seems that uh, uh, there can be uh, you know, some, some sort of hope about this condition. So although overall global incidence is still increasing, there is a promising aspect in which trends in some instances are decreasing. If we can establish these positive fa factors, we will be on the right track to manage this disease better. Okay. So with that, I'd like to end my lecture and to thank you for your kind attention. So maraming salamat po sa lahat. I'd like to turn it over back to our MC moderator, Dr. Maris De Leon. Recording stopped. Thank you so much again, Dr. Buenaventura, for that very informative and insightful lecture. Now let me open the floor for the discussion and the question and answer portion. You may type your questions in the chat box or you may raise your hand. Good afternoon, um, Dr. Benaventura. Very nice. Um, actually, I have a question, sir. Um, sure. You discussed about like the typical, um, I guess, presentations uh, with the cognitive and the behavioral changes. But with when you talk to the family, but for as your sources, what do they usually um, initially notice but with their um, with their family? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Typically, uh, in the Philippines as well, you know, I do see this a lot as far as my patients who are brought in for consultation. Um, uh, just to mention first that in the Philippines, by the time a patient with Alzheimer's dementia is brought for evaluation, the patient is generally at the moderate or even severe stages of the illness. It's very rare. It's, it's not, not rare, but it's, not, it's generally uncommon for patients in the mild stages of the illness to be brought for assessment. 
so that by the time they're brought in and they're already moderate ill, and if you backtrack as far as the patient's history is concerned, they, they would generally mention that the patient started to become forgetful in court, and then that gradually progressed over time. The challenge kasi here in the Philippines is that you know, if for those of you who are familiar with the term ulianin or in English senility, in the Philippines, pagiging uliano or become senile is sort of expected uh, as we grow older. So when an so that when uh, an older relative develops uh, early manifestations of dementia, they're they're generally not brought for assessment because again because people think that that's uh, normal, okay, that that's expected. It's only until the individual develops uh, very bizarre pervasive behaviors, what we referred to earlier as behavioral and psychological symptoms, that the family would consider bringing the patient for assessment, okay, which is truly unfortunate. Uh, but 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 still, it's it's good that they event eventually brought in. But however, of course, the earlier that the patient is brought in for assessment, the better overall for the patient and of course the family as well. Thank you very much, sir. Actually, that's um, uh, I've noticed that, sir. Whenever I I interview the families, they said, "Oh, no, pag uliani pero normal lang naman." So they still think it's part of the natural, ano yeah. po, um, the process. Mm -hmm. True. Thank you, Paul. So, which means that all of us who are engaged in mental health care should. Um, I said we have a we have a term in uh, geriatric psychiatry or psychodiagnostic, which called ageism. So, like that instance, that's that's part of ageism. Uh, ageism refers to uh, misconceptions and myths about growing old. So, it, it, even even the incidence of Alzheimer's dementia, as although the the incidence is increasing and there's a lot of, but if you look at it in terms of overall percentages, less than ten percent of the elderly population have uh, dementia in one form or another. So that means nine out of 10 older adults will, ha will have no cognitive impairment. Okay. Um, and, 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 we sh and that's why one of the things we can help our, our, our countrymen to understand is that, you know, pagiging uh, ulyanin or developing senility is not a normal uh, occurrence of, of aging and that it should be a warning signal for, for the older adult to, to be brought to the hospital for evaluation at the very least. So all of us should be able to help, help emphasize that and teach that to family, younger family members. Hi, sir. I actually have a question also. Yes, um, sir. So in treating patients po with dementia, is it advisable for patients to be seen and managed by both neurology and psychiatry services since the brain is the one that's involved? Mm -hmm. the, the practice in other countries kasi is uh, there, for example, like if, even in the Philippines, you know, as we have seen in Western practice in Western countries, there are uh, at least three, at least three, I'm not just saying that there should only be three, there are at least three groups of individuals who can uh, evaluate and manage a patient with uh, dementia, particularly Alzheimer's dementia. No? So that includes us, the psychiatrists, the neurologists, of course, and of course the geriatricians as well. Okay, but um, in, for example, like I, I trained in Sydney, Australia, and in Australia, the general practitioner is the one who's really managing the patient. The specialist is simply a consultant. Okay, so that's the in 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 Commonwealth countries, uh, the word consultant is really used for for what it really stands for to someone who's just consulted. Okay, so like in my case, when I was there as a training uh, as a psychotherapist, I would provide my opinions, and then the patient will go back eventually to their general practice or their GP. Okay, for continued management. Okay. Um, just just like referring to a psychiatrist from a family physician, you know, there are several indications for that. But but ideally, any patient with any any disease, including Alzheimer's dementia, 
should be managed at the GP level or what we call primary healthcare level. Okay. So there's, there should be no ownership as far as uh, these patients are concerned, as long as the individual, uh, as long as the physician or the medical practitioner uh, knows how to assess and manage the, the patient, then, I mean, go ahead. Okay. Because uh, remember in our country, th there's, there's not enough urology psychiatrists and even geriatricians to, to look after all the elderly patients. So that's why we have to re rely on other specialists and including of course our uh, primary healthcare physicians. Thank you so much, Dr. Buenaventura. Um, we have a, a comment here at the chat box. So from Lulu Ignacio. Dr. Buenaventura, thank you for this lecture. There are neuroimaging studies done among those practicing meditation to show less the expected atrophy in the brain among those in the elderly. This opened us to consider that in addition to the biopsychosocial model and looking at our patients in any age group, meditation, which is a spiritual practice, has an important role in this discussion. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Ignacio. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, Paul, um, I did not focus uh, on management kasi for, for the purposes of this lecture, but you are right. No, um, Anything, uh, complementary and alternative medicine will also be very helpful for, for not just patients with dementia, but also for generally patients, generally for everyone, truth to tell. And also a meditation is, uh, I had just, I, uh, I was just in a, lecture recently and I, I emphasize the role of uh, these uh, types of uh, treatment approaches for individuals with mental health conditions. It, it, it's true. Um, so yes, so, so I agree with what you said. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that comment, Dr. Lulu Ignacio. We appreciate it. Bong? Yes. Is it okay? Over. I just verbally ask my question out of curiosity. I sure, Dr. Luzpo, you're most welcome to do so. Kuya Bong, <laughs> I just figured it's a, a, out of curiosity. We always hear, I know it's not about management, that, oh, majong, in your ballroom dancing and all that. But of course, you realize any mental activity mm -hmm. will really kind of sharpen but sleeping so and then you see this um aged women doing mahjong already aged came in uh, or the other or uh, vice versa so i'm just curious anecdotes lang naman siguro yun. pero may i know uh, about this is there some a study or truth to that and many any other activity mm -hmm. that is really accessible mm -hmm. well generally physical activity of any form is recommended uh, for aging individuals, um, but the but the idea behind this is that it's not it should not be applied uh, on, only when the individual has gone older. You know, it's, it's something that we should employ or use uh, even while we're younger. And that's the point of uh, Dr. Knopman when he included childhood health or well-being as as possibly a factor as well in delimiting. Uh, dementia and because you know a healthy lifestyle that we employ early on will of course contribute to hopefully better uh, health in in the long run um i'm not familiar i'm not i've not heard of any specific studies related to ballroom dancing in specifically okay but if we look at it in terms of the general results of studies involving physical activity or physical exercise then the, the results tend to be very positive Thanks. You're Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Luis, for your question. Dr. Lulu Ignacio again has a comment in the chat box. So this opens us to consider further discussion on the broad conceptual framework for MH, the biological, psycho, psychological, social, and spiritual dimension, which we are in the Philippines now. Advocate and hope we can include this in our lectures. Thank mm -hmm. you. True. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, Paul. Pero, um, I, I, although I, again, it would depend on the the goals for the lecture. But uh, if if I were going to talk about management, I would surely include this. Thank you.
Do we have any more questions or other comments? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, I'll end this part of the lecture for today. Mm -hmm. So I'll give the floor now to Dr. Rina Almadin to give the closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Um, De Leon. Thank you so much, Dr. Benaventura, for your engaging and informative lecture on Alzheimer's dementia, which has physical, social, and economic impacts, not only for those living with it, but also for their carers, their family, and the society at large. Um, thank you for presenting the typical process and the trends of dementia cases, especially in the de in um, developing countries, which will be important for um, the our anticipated population of patients um, will be seeing once we are established psychiatrists. So again, thank you, Dr. Benaventura, and to everyone for their time and attention in joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon.